Well, Guy, thank you very much for taking time to share your insights into the future of leadership. But before we go into leadership, please tell us where you're from and where did you start your career? Where did you grow up? Okay, Nick, um, great to be, be um, part of this process and, uh, and to share my story and my views on, on the world. Thank you. Um, I was born in Zambia in, in those days, uh, Northern Rhodesia. Uh, in 1961, so that was just at the tail end of the the old British colonial system. At that stage, it was a British um, pr protectorate. So I was born in the latter part of, of that sort of phase of the influence of the Brits in the world. So uh, f father, English, mother, South African, um, but uh, moved down to South Africa when I was three years old. So I only really know South Africa and Joburg in particular. Um, I had a wonderful education at... Um, St. John's College in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. and um, that's where I matriculated. So you grew up in Joburg? Yes. And then where did you start your career? All right, the, the, the Joburg aspect is still relevant in terms of how my career kicked off, because I had a fascination for building model aeroplanes, particularly Battle of Britain era, World War II, did all the, all the RAF aircraft um, in, in model form, all, all the Luftwaffe aircraft in model form. And when I'd run out of all the options in the Second World War, I started to build more modern aircraft. And at the age of 15, I built this 1 in 24 scale model Harrier, GR1, jump jet. And as I was building it, and it took me about three months because it was quite an intricate model to make, I just fell in love with the machine. And I, I decided that that is what I'm going to do in my life. And, and what inspired you to delve into the history of um, air battles? I, I, I come from a, a military background. My father was a major. My grandfather was a colonel in, in, in the British Army. So, so I, I had a fascination for the, 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 uh, the military, the British military in particular. And, um, but I, I also had a fascination for flight. So the combination of those two made it quite logical that I, mm -hmm. I seek a, a career in the British military to get my commission over in the UK and get into the RAF. So that's, it was born out of um, my fascination for building models at the age of 15. So when I, when I, 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 I left school, I managed to get into the, the Royal Air Force, even though to get commissioned you required um, three A-levels or, or a degree. And through some administrative errors on their behalf, they didn't realize that, that I had neither. They thought I went to St. John's College, Cambridge, and I had a joint matriculation board degree from um, uh, St. John's College in Cambridge. So um, th they, in the selection criteria, they made an error and, and, and I managed to, to, to get in and they, they, they waived that exception in that particular case. So I was woefully underqualified to go into what I did, but I was very lucky. The, the, the universe just lined up in terms of, of um, letting me realize my vision. Somehow all the obstacles seem to have, have disappeared. So I got my commission um, at uh, um, RAF College Cranwell, uh, became an officer there, was commissioned personally by the Queen, and then um, flew seven different types of aircraft, ending up on, on, on the Harrier GR3, the jump jet, which was always my, my absolute passion and, and pride and joy. So I, I, I learned one major thing out of that particular journey um, uh, in, in a very strong leadership environment, whereby you were structurally taught to be a leader of men, particular under uh, under very extreme circumstances but what I really learned out of that more than anything else is that that if you have a very profound vision of what you want to do and that came out uh, accidentally through my building of a model Harry at the age of 15 if you are absolutely um, if you have this this object of desire that is strong enough um, nothing will stop you from getting there um, and I think there, there, there's a wonderful analogy of it's a little bit like like a, a, a dog that has a passion for chasing a ball. No matter which direction you throw the ball in, the dog will always go for the ball. Um, and and if there is certainty about an end result, and I think this is so applicable to, to, to leaders today, always was, but it's especially now. If there is certainty about where you want to go, um, it's, it's much more important to be a leader of somewhere rather than be a leader of someone. Because if there is certainty in terms of, an, of, a, of what victory looks like, it's, it's quite incredible how your energies and how you exude those energies and, and infuse them 
uh, to the people around you, and they know exactly what that vision is. They will they will follow the vision much more than they will even follow you. So so that was a great lesson in leadership. My mm-hmm. desire to be a Harrier jump jet pilot, even though I've never been to to, to the UK. And I believe you then extended your piloting career into business. Yes. Well, in, 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 the, in the interim, I, 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 well, I came back to South Africa because I just I, culturally I'm, I'm, I'm better suited to this particular environment and, I, and this, it's just home for me. But I wanted to use my special forces experience. Um, and when I was flying the Harrier jump jet, we used to deal extensively with the SAS, the Special Air Services. Mm-hmm. Um, and they would laser guide and spike what, what they call laser spike our, our, um, uh, our, our laser bombs in terms of, of directing accuracy down to tanks to within about seven foot. So I enjoyed d- d- uh, operating within the special forces environment in particular. So when I came back to South Africa, I started a business in logistics. Um, and instead of special air services, SAS, I called it special operation services, mm-hmm. SOS. And I wanted to be in the logistics game, but to be able to do logistics much more um, uh, at a much higher level of speciality than than conventional uh, um, logistics which was which I would call like the infant, uh, the infantry so the sort of DHLs and, and the the TNTs and the UPSs of this world for example um, I wanted to be more special forces than that so it was that sort of military understanding of being in special forces of how to create a logistics business that was completely different to the conventional. So that, that, that's, that's how I managed to make my money in, in logistics. And I believe you disrupted the traditional model of logistics in the IT industry. Absolutely. Uh, uh, through, through a whole series of, sort of organic learnings in terms of the correlations between the levels of inventory that c- the computer industry would need to hold mm. to be able to service um, repairs and maintenance of, 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 of their computers, the cost of holding the inventory was monumental because it just becomes obsolete so so rapidly in in, in, in a fast changing technology environment. So, the cost of of um, of maintaining the inventory, just in terms of obsolescence and cost of capital t- tied up in, in inventory, was so severe that I worked out a new way of completely changing the game by moving computer parts around the world so quickly in under twenty four hours, right into a machine in South Africa from Holland, that the inventory levels would drop down to next to nothing. Uh, so it was, in fact, a financial model uh, that I, I was able to, to increase the levels of service and decrease the cost of the inventory by moving it so quickly. And I, I had a couple of, of philosophies that I used, which was terminal velocity collapses geography. So if you move something so quickly, it makes geography irrelevant. Mm. This was in the 19, uh, um, early 1990s when I, when I started this particular concept. But it, it completely disrupted the conventional ways of doing things, um, which allowed, through the disruption, a, a allowed a complete game-changing um, type of business model to be applied through that disruption. But it was only ever operating at, at what I call this being on the fringe of the rational and the insane, or the perceived insane. It's only on that cusp do you get any really fundamental game-changing mm. uh, situations occurring? It cannot be in, in the insane bracket and tiny. It cannot be in the, the rational environment and tiny. Otherwise, you'll commoditize or you'll be unrealistic. But somehow, on the cusp of the rational and the insane, do you find the most incredible magic can happen? So would you say there's a fine line between genius and madness? Uh, they are definitely overlapping like a, like a Venn diagram. They, they, they certainly do overlap. And, you know, there have been plenty of people who have been classified as, as, being, uh, uh, as being mad who, in, in retrospect, have, have been identified as game changers. They, they just function so far outside the convention that they were seen to be irrational. Now, during your SOS times, you developed a certain formula for <coughs> creating a high-performance culture yeah. in your own company. Yeah. How did this come about? All right. I mean, this is where it sort of links through. It doesn't seem to, to, to be a common thread between being a, a, a fast jet uh, tank buster, which is what my job was in, in my 20s, to move, moving computer parts around the world in, in a hurry. But I, I developed an interest in applied mathematics when I was flying the Harrier jump jet because we didn't have the, the technology and the avionics of today. And literally everything 
we, we operated on was was pretty much like the World War One pilots would do, but in in a, in a, in a jet that does Mach one point four. Um, but um, so we had to understand mathematics to a, a, a far higher degree in terms of the functionality of, of navigation, air to air combat, mm. weaponeering, etc. So we had a series of, of algebraic equations largely in our heads that, that every time you applied them, they would simplify the complexity of, of, mm. of your world and allow you to succeed, to, to both stay alive and, 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 and win your fights. And this was before the days of GPS, uh, right? Exactly, exactly. So it was literally a paper map, azimuth, and a stopwatch that you had to wind in terms of being able to get around. And then air to air combat, which is pi r squared and 2 pi r, and you had to understand the geometry of the sky. But suddenly I realized that, that mathematics applies more to life than we realize. So for example, E equals mc squared, the most famous formula in the world, functioned and always has functioned since the Big Bang, but was only identified by Einstein in 1910. But the, the point is, once you understand the functionality of a formula, and when it is true, when it has been peer reviewed, and it is beyond question to be true, it suddenly serves a huge amount of different applications. It's a bit like the invention of the laser. The laser was invented before there was any application for it, or even a consideration for, of, of an application for it. So with my interest in, in, in applied mathematics, somebody said to me at SOS, just at the point that I got a big um, uh, contract with Compaq, uh, pre the acquisition by, um, by HP, um, to be the sole spare parts distributor in South Africa and, and run the logistics around Africa. And as an owner managed business, it took us from about 35 people to about 180 people eventually. And I knew that there was something quite scary about that growth, that how to maintain a very specific strategy of the organization, keeping ourselves differentiated from the conventional um, industry, but having to, to hire a lot of people, most of whom came from the conventional industry, and by definition, there was always a risk that the organization, the business, my own managed business mm -hmm. may commoditize because you were all of these, uh, and I say this with love and respect, sort of fairly conventional thinkers. So how to get everybody to focus on keeping the special operations mm -hmm. business distinct from the conventional industry required some kind of structure, some kind of model, some kind of set of reference points that covered our strategy, our differentiators, our operating philosophy, the ability to conceptualize and innovate and, and, and attract the, uh, the, the attention of customers to be able to provide a whole business solution. There was a new way of thinking, but then how to codify that in such a way that everyone understood. Mm -hmm. So that was a very important thing for me. And somebody said to me, you, you have an incredible formula for success at, at SOS. But um, I thought, well, if there's a formula, let's see if we can work it out mm -hmm. with my interest in applied mathematics. So literally by accident, I looked at a range of, of different um, mathematical structures to try and find something to, to see, to hang together this formula to be able to work out what is the blueprint, the code, the, the DNA for SOS in particular. And I very much like the structure of the algebraic equation because you've got two very distinct dynamics which apply in life and apply in business. That in algebra, you have the numerator in the equation which is constructive to value and you have the denominator in the equation which is destructive to value. So in any business environment or any venture <clears throat> or any humor endeavor, there are always you, always, you always have this, these enabling and disabling support and challenge, constructive and destructive mm -hmm. dynamics that are always at play. Um, the duality, and this is the way of life and business anyway, you've got profit and loss, you've got asset and liability, you've got debits and credits, you've got income and expenses. In the reality of business, you have constantly, you are presented with this duality of potentially opposing forces. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, I now lecture at two MBA schools, Gibbs and Witz uh, Business School, and I've only found recently that there's an academic retrofit around what is called force field, force field um, 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 uh, dynamics, which apply to any organization, these opposing constructive and destructive forces. But it was really more accidental and intuitive and organic that I, I managed to develop this formula in um, consulting with my people to get them involved in, in developing what is this formula, what is this blueprint that is going to differentiate us from the rest of our competitors. And then it, it ended up in this written formula of numerator critical success enables me to be doing more of and denominator critical success disables me to be doing less of 
to differentiate ourselves to become the only one in our industry. And that took about three months, but it was all in this kind of written format. But just at that stage, we were moving into a new boardroom as so we were expanding. And I realized that we needed to put pictures up on the wall. Um, and I thought, well, you know, maybe this formula, because I was mm -hmm. quite excited about it, and so was everybody else because they were involved in it. Maybe there's a way that we could, we could um, visually depict the, mm -hmm. the constructs in the equation and make it something that, that mm -hmm. would stand out, we would see every day. So I converted each of the elements in, 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 the, in, in the, the formula into a piece of art. We ended up with this art gallery that wrapped around the boardroom that constantly was this constant reminder of the philosophy and the ideology mm -hmm. of the business to, to, to become the only one in the industry. And it was really just through this accidental um, uh, intrigue that I had uh, and this instinct that I had that, that we had a DNA that needed to be codified and, and, and displayed that just allowed me and, and everybody else and, and w when it came to recruiting people to, to have a, a much kind of stronger sense of an articulation of the so-called soft factors mm. in the organization that they could see instantly the nature of the dynamics of our culture um, and, and then through these abilities to, to have structured conversations uh, used to be called uh, scramblies um, every Thursday to actually go through the reality of the, the last week's experiences against the formula just gave us a, an ability to have structured conversations continuously against a blueprint, a formula that would make us the, the only one in the industry. And uh, so I, I, never, I never intended to, to develop this formula concept into a commercial offering. I was just seeking something as a leader in the organization to align and bind everybody to the unique positioning of the business. So how did this as a commercial model came about? When you sold SOS, were you thinking about that already? Partly, Nick, in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the back of my head, I was, mm. I, was, I was very endeared to the formula because it, it, it kept me and, and so many people on track mm. in terms of continuously seeing where we were deviating from the formula. So it was very useful to me, and I couldn't imagine being in the business without a formula. So when I, I sold that business to a private equity investment organization in 2000, I had a res restraint of trade, um, but I didn't even want to be in logistics any longer. I wanted to do something else completely different with my life. So I thought, well, let me see if I, 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 I can make a business out of assisting other organizations and leaders to be able to develop this sort of very coherent uh, uh, and uh, articulate visual, structured, unambiguous, cultural DNA that would allow them to differentiate themselves from their competitors. And by now you've, I believe, covered 100 plus organizations? 130 um, organizations in, in 36 countries, focusing mainly in the blue chip sector. Average size client base, I would say, between about 3,000 and 6,000. Although currently we're doing four organizations with, with uh, tens of thousand employees each. Now, I believe it's much more than just culture change. I believe it's a model to drive business performance. Absolutely. Uh, the, way, the way that I, I, I would summarize it is it's, it's how to balance the logic and magic to become the only one in your industry. The only one? In, the, in your industry. Okay. And I believe you've seen some quite astounding results in terms Absolutely. of the bottom line. Absolutely. So, so um, I, I, I lecture at Gibbs uh, MBA School and Fitz MBA School. They, they, they run a series, a series of, of, of um, back to back academic case studies doing work in terms of correlating the various measurement results that, that we find within our clients' environments against the customer service impact and then against the financials. Um, and the, uh, the ROIs range between about, uh, uh, about, um, 5,000 percent to about a hundred thousand percent and I know that sounds almost unrealistic because it's a thousand times what, what, what you paid but the, independently through these academic case studies it's, it's showing a, a degree of between about five thousand and a hundred thousand percent ROI in terms of the work we do that can be attributed directly to uh, the offering against the, the, the financial benefits so looking back at your career is it fair to say there were two major turning points yes so from the Air Force to SOS and then yes. from SOS to Blueprints. Yes, indeed. And what is driving you today? 
what drives me today is, I mean, I, I have a fairly clear purpose in my life, and it is to maximize the potential of people or organizations with what they have. And, and, and it's important to state with what they have, because I'm, I'm not pretending that, that I, what I do or the model that I have is the solution to world tension. But it's, it's, it's taking what already exists. If an organization, for example, is, is considering to, to, to go through a restructure and, and, and retrenching 10% of the staff to become more efficient, uh, uh, drive bottom line, whatever, quite often this, this is seen to be an alternative to that, to, to be able to infuse far more organizational um, effective outcomes by being able to get everybody aligned around the goal of the organization to, to dominate it, its, its industry and to drive market share and to actually take a much more constructive uh, and an expansive view to the organization rather than, than a, a destructive contraction issue uh, 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 approach to, to an organization. So it's almost a new way of doing business. I, I couldn't agree more, Nick. And, and you know, I know I'm, I'm talking about my own product, and obviously I have utter belief in it, and it's my own invention. Um, but it, it is so radical. It, we, we have a 50% measurable average increase in organizational effectiveness within an 18-month period within an organization with, with se several thousands of employees. So, so it's a, it's a self-evidential type mm -hmm. outcome that we see again and again that is that is identified by independent parties, the academics in particular. So let's talk about leadership. What yeah. does the future of leadership mean to you? All right. I, I have the benefit of having worked with 130 CEOs, uh, largely blue chip organizations throughout the world. And um, I've obviously seen a huge range in terms of different styles, but I have the, the benefit of being able to understand them, getting deeply in, in terms of their desires and their passion for the organization, but then also because the Blueprints process engages everybody within the organization, we obviously have huge insight bottom up in terms of the reality of, 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 of the organization. Um, so I see it both from the leader's perspective and then from the people's perspective. And there is always a, a disconnect, Nick, from, from one degree to the other, uh, to, to, to another. There is a, there, being a leader is actually an incredibly lonely position uh, and very often having got to the top of an organization, They, by virtue of that, they start to become removed from the people on the ground. Mm -hmm. And the people on the ground tend to be closer to the customers and the reality of, of the effectiveness of the organizations than, than, than the leadership are. So that's exactly what Reapers tries to reconcile. But the leaders are, by definition, they are disconnected. Mm -hmm. So I try to assist my clients' leadership, CEOs in particular, to become more connected to their people. And there, 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 there are a, a few trends that I, I've come across. I can, I can say probably about 10% of the leaders are truly exceptional. Mm -hmm. Maybe another 20% are, are really good leaders. And, and, and then one goes, one goes down, down the scale. So if I look at, at the, sort of the, 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 the top 10% of leaders, I, I would say that there are certain common factors. And I know that they're good leaders from a range of different reasons. One, you get ratification and endorsement from the people that they are great leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but two, the fact is that they they have a very clear vision of what they want to do, uh, and and that's that's incredibly important that there is a an object of desire that they have as an end result for the organization, and the that 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 is an absolute imperative. They also need to almost have a belief in the impossible nowadays. Mm. Uh, the, the, the conventional safe space of being in the, in the center of the standard distribution curve is just not going to fly. So there needs to be, there needs to be a, a uh, um, I wouldn't say so much of a radical, but an, an, a, an unconventional view in terms of how to reposition the organization into a different space. No, no organization in any kind of commoditized environment is, is, is thriving at this, this point with, 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 a, with a, a flat market a depressed market in some countries and certainly here in South Africa I'm, I'm, I, you can see it all over the place that unless unless you're looking to reinvent yourself into a completely new space that there's a high risk of, of possibility going down the track you, you'll become obsolete so when you speak to young and upcoming leaders future leaders what have you learned from your own journey that you okay. consider most important for right. future leaders Nick I would say be real the, the mm. most important thing is to be real to be authentic to be an authentic leader um, the, 
I almost see it as if the employees should should vote you in or vote you out every year. Mm. I honestly believe that. I believe that the that the people themselves will know uh, what the right kind of leader for the organization is. I mean, I, I know that's completely unconventional because it's normally seen the other way around and, and you just get the, 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 the leader that, that, that you have. But you actually need the permission. I know that's another strong word. You need the permission from the organization that you are worthy of being a leader. So so you need to have a range of different attributes. The one is authenticity, that, that what you see is what you get and, and you are just, you are... Um, you are open, you are available, you are human, and you are connected to the people, that, that you, you will protect them from the bus, mm. um, that they feel cared for. You know, research shows, Nick, that, that, that the sixth most compelling reason why employees will leave an organization is reward and recognition, remuneration. Mm. All of the other factors above that are the softer issues, the leadership issues, and... and mm. And, 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 you know, and another key point, and these, this, this comes out of Gallup research, is that most people will leave an organization because they have an issue with their boss, not their company. So you don't leave a company 99% of the time you leave your boss. So that comes down to leadership. Now, there are certain, certain people who should not be in an organization, and sometimes it's not, not, a, not a, an unhappy thing that they leave. But the retention of, of competent uh, talent is absolutely vital, vital for the, the well-being of an organization. You know, it takes a year to two years to, to, to bring up a replacement in any kind of key, mm. key role in any uh, organization. So there's a, there's a cost and there's an impact in terms of timing of that. So the retention of people is absolutely vital. So w where, where leadership is poor and one gets a high attrition rate mm. in terms of, of, uh, of, of the loss of key talent, that has has a devastating impact on, on the effectiveness of the organization, the, the customer service impact and the financials. And those are very measurable. So leadership is vital. So authentic leadership. People don't always want to be led. They, 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 want, they want to know where the organization is going. They want mm. to know that the leader has an ambitious view no matter what the economic circumstances are. And a leader who, who goes into victim mode around external circumstances, quite frankly, should not be a leader because there are ways to get around that and they have to show that they have have the have the the courage mm. to have a, a hairy audacious goal, regardless of the circumstances. For that goal and that that what victory looks like to be very clear in in his or her head, and that to be shared throughout the organisation. How the organisation gets there needs to involve the people substantially uh, through uh, through empowering people and through a very inclusive process in terms of participation. To get to the goal, it's a little bit like like throwing a, a, a ball and a dog chases the dog. Mm. The dog will find ways of jumping over the various obstacles mm. or into the sea, whatever. Mm. Doesn't matter. It will go go for the end result. Mm. So people don't like to be micromanaged. People don't like to be overly led either. They need to know what the end goal is, and they need to, need to feel in, in, in included mm. in that process. They have to have purpose. They have to have purpose, and when the leader yeah. has purpose, well, then they'll have have purpose too. So, so the, the, the leader is responsible for defining the what or the why, mm. uh, what we're going to go for or, uh, and or why we exist and, and what differentiates us in the world out there. The, the best leaders consult with their people in terms of you tell us bottom up how we're going to get there. So not only is there, there a clear goal, but the, act, but the, but the route to, to achieving that, 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 that victory must be done through co-creation, must be done bottom up and must show a degree of respect and value for the opinions and the energies of the people to be part of that journey. If that happens, there's this monumental ability to use the energy of the masses of the organization to achieve the goal rather than banging away from this, the center as a leader in terms of, of forcing people to get there. So they go willingly. Now, Guy, as technology is changing ever faster, and the future seems to be more uncertain. What would you recommend future leaders to, to, to focus on to future-proof their right. career? All right. And that, that's a great point. They've got to be looking at least five or ten years down the track. Mm. Uh, and it's, it, it reminds me, me a little bit of, of, of the days uh, flying low level at 200 foot. Um, at, 
at Mach 0.97 because we were, were not legally allowed to, to, to fly supersonic over land. Um, but at that kind of speed, when, when things are happening very quickly, we literally, at any particular moment, at, at 200 foot above the ground at Mach 0.97, you have to be two kilometers ahead at any, at any, mm -hmm. any given point. There's no way that, that, that if, you, if you, you, you came across a, um, a church spire um, at, uh, at 500 meters, mm -hmm. you, there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to hit it. You're just moving too fast. So you have to constantly be two kilometers ahead in terms of exactly what's happening and then be able to maneuver everything, the, 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 the aircraft and, and, uh, and your trajectory around a, a two kilometer um, uh, uh, advance point. So they have to be looking uh, five or ten years down the track, uh, looking at uh, general trends around the world, particularly from a South African perspective, even though South Africa is enormously innovative in, in, in many ways and in many industries, particularly banking sector, uh, um, mining, engineering, uh, and you know, in a range of you know, tourism, uh, advanced in many ways. But we, one has, has to be very, one has to watch the trends from around the world. And at this particular point, uh, particularly in, in, in the Far East. Uh, my, my, my views on, and having done a lot of work in China and, and, and Singapore and Malaysia, etc., um, the, the, the level of thinking and the ability to change and, and transform the whole, all the conventions of business are happening more there than anywhere else. So keeping an eye on international trends and tracking them, whatever industry you are mm. in, realizing that every industry is under threat, but there are also huge opportunities as well to... to not only follow a, a new thought leadership way of functioning, but also to invent your own. Now, when it comes to technology, what are the key technologies that you see will play a major role in leadership? Yeah. Well, you know, primarily, Nick, through communications and the ability, to, the, 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 the fact that that's, that there are so many methods of communication now and and the fact that people in fact are adopting their own way of communicating uh, uh, with each other obviously you've got social media which is which is the most predominant mm. aspect of that but people are just communicating in very different ways and and uh, uh, the ability for them to become knowledgeable or enlightened or dissatisfied so let's say there is is a, an issue of rumor going around an organization that it's about it's you know it's about to go through a restructure or something those communication those communications happen anyway so there, there there is a force whereby um the sort of collective communication uh methodologies are happening in any event and unless unless the leadership has the ability to to be part of that dialogue mm -hmm. moving away from the conventional top-down way of, of passing decrees uh, then, then there's a there's a there's a big risk of a disconnect between the people and and, uh, and the leader. Now you mentioned social media. Mm. Which social media platform or platforms would you recommend aspiring leaders should use, master, apply? Nick, there's no question that that LinkedIn is the one that has served us the most. Uh, it's it's it is the the most inverted commas serious type of social media system that I have I've come across the fact that one can manage your network the, the fact that one has the ability to um, be seen as a thought leader sort of build up a following I, I write blogs two or three times a month uh, and I can see that those the degree to which those blogs are being followed is, is, is increasing all the mm -hmm. time and also the ratio between the amount of likes and and reads which shows that the quality is increasing however the Facebook have intentionally have, have, have made it a mission of theirs to get very strongly into the the uh, the, the commercial uh, business uh, social media space exactly how that is evolving I'm not sh I'm not sure and we keep a, a good uh, eye on those uh, uh, quite a few of the people of my people go on courses continuously I'm I am yet to see the real uh, thrust of, of how Facebook are, are going to change the shape of, of the of the sort of business social media side of things, but um, I'm hearing from very respectable sources that 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 they are going to emerge as a big player mm. in in the business social media space. Now, can you share with us maybe a success story or two from your clients where they have applied not only applied blueprints but turned around the business 
and really assumed leadership, brand leadership in their industry. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think uh, uh, this are, I refer to um, a couple, one or two of the um, academic case studies because at least you know, I, I can speak with certainty that we have mm -hmm. an independent uh, publication of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of research into, into our work. Um, one example is, is um, Mass Build, part of Mass Mart. That's Builders Warehouse, Builders Express, and Builders mm -hmm. Trade Depot. Uh, in 2009, they were the poor cousin of the MassMart group. There was no growth in, in the business, and there was a consideration by the group to potentially uh, sell the brand, to just mm -hmm. continue uh, with the brand. New leadership uh, that came into play, a man called Llewellyn Walters, uh, he saw this particular model, and he embraced it to the extent that he, he saw it as, as the primary turnaround mechanism mm -hmm. for the organization. So we, we implemented uh, their blueprint in terms of aligning all their people to their strategy in 2009. And, and, and there was this very substantial measurable rise uh, in the Blueprints Index, which is a calculation of the numerator scores over denominator scores of their blueprint, which shows an effective improvement in the efficiency and the wellness of the organization to function within an 18-month period. Uh, and that that kept on growing uh, to, to the extent that uh, the academics got involved because they were fascinating that an organization with so many thousands of people uh, could be uh, uh, could have done such a rapid transformation so they did independent studies in terms of looking at the correlations between um, our measurables around the the organizational effectiveness uh, um, wellness indices mm -hmm. uh, the rise in the external measurements around customer satisfaction and then leading in, into uh, the, 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 the financials themselves. And there was a direct correlation between all three, the, the, the blueprints index, the customer service index, and, and the financials. Um, and as a result, today they are the, the darling of the MassMart group, and they literally win all the awards uh, pretty much uh, in, in terms of, of, of financial performance, in terms of, of, uh, uh, of talent retention, in terms of employee engagement. Can you share with us the financial impact of blueprints yeah. at yeah. Um, Mesmart? They can put around about a billion rands worth of value to, to, to the implementation. A billion rands? Directly, yes. So is it fair to say blueprints is a scientific method to execute strategy effectively? It, it, it is, but I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm reticent to use the word scientific because we try and bring as much science as we can to it. But, but in the purest definition of what science is mm. um I, I i wouldn't go that far but it, it 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 applies as much science as one possibly can to be able to bring out the intangibles within the organization so the way that i really s summarize it is is how to balance the logic through statistics and the magic mm. through eq uh through through graf graphic representation and continuous mindful exposure mm. uh to the structure of the dna um, that brings around a, a very strong differentiation within the organization, the retention of kind of key people. The energy is all focused around a, a very specific long, long medium to, to, to long-term thrust within the organization. Now, are there any role models of leadership you would recommend aspiring leaders should study? Uh, you want them by name? Yes. I, I would say that, that the... The real great leaders that I have worked with directly uh, would be Llewellyn Walters, the CEO of, of MassBuild. I would say Louis Hearing uh, and uh, um, Thierry Pillay, uh, both CEOs Deloitte. Of, of Deloitte Consulting. Uh, uh, very different styles, but, but true, authentic, very high EQ, super bright human leaders. Um, I would say um, Jonathan Lowe, formerly CEO of, of, um, uh, of, of Adcock Ingram, um, Ajahn Sita, who's the, the, the CEO of, of um, EY mm. Africa. So that's just to, to, to name a few. And there are, there are many, many more than that. But, but, but uh, every day, in fact, I, I, am, I am privileged to be working with some some very capable CEOs. And make no mistake, Nick, this, this kind of delusion of getting to the top and, 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 and how wonderful that must be, uh, the, it's a hell of a lonely position. It really is. 
and and the more that I feel in my purpose in, in life that I can support leaders to be able to maximize the success, the better. I did some unsolicited work for um, uh, President Barack Obama by doing exactly the same thing, by translating his philosophy into this right brain language, uh, which I sent to him in the form of a, a coffee table book. Um, he's, uh, the U.S. Embassy dropped off a letter of thanks from him personally, and he used three elements of it in his re-election campaign. So I'm there naturally, and I, when I say unsolicited, I did it just because I thought he's a hell of a good guy, and he, he, you know, and 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 any kind of support he can get from from any source is worthwhile. And uh, I thought I, I I would see what I could do. So that's my job to support leaders to maximize their success by understanding that they all every organization is dysfunctional to a degree, and the reason why they're dysfunctional is because. Human beings are dysfunctional. Humanity is dysfunctional. Mm. The country is dysfunctional. The world is dysfunctional and always has been and always will be. But it's about how to mitigate that mm. and how to deal with it in an advanced organizational psychology approach to be able to create a wellness and a passion and a focus and, 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 and an energized group dynamic to be able to maximize the success of an environment. But it's around the CEO and, and assisting him or her to be able to get all of their people to achieve the dreams that they have. So, Guy, where can people follow your thought leadership and how should they connect with you? Uh, they, uh, through my, my website, uh, which is uh, blueprints.co.za, um, either that or um, I, I send out something on a weekly basis um, uh, by email. So, my email is... Uh, Guy at blueprints, B L U E P R I N T S dot C O dot Z A, and then or connect with me on, on LinkedIn, Guy Martin. And you are blogging on LinkedIn and uh, on the website. I, 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 we do, yes, indeed. Now, last but not least, Guy, is there one thing, one final piece of advice you would really like to give to future leaders that they should look at and implement in their own career? Mm, Nick, it's tricky when it, when it comes down to re reducing to, to one thing. Um, I, I would say this, because what I found, not in most cases, the majority of cases, but in all cases, there is a tendency, not a tendency, it, it's, it's a reality, and I, I'm going to be this bold to say it, is that leadership, leaders, tend to underestimate the intelligence and the capability of their people, the, the intellectual value, the experience that they've got, the, the, the fact that their employees are normally much more connected with the reality on the ground and, with, and they are able to see the whites of the eyes of the customers and their expressions. They know when things are working and when they're not working. I, I, and I would say that, that, that universally there is a... Uh, very strong inclination to, to underestimate the genius within the organization. And I think that is terribly sad. And, you know, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways. If a leader decides to show respect and love and care for the people and their opinions and involve them, empower them, get them part of the innovation uh, 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 process, listen to them, authentically respond to, to good stuff, the people's engagement levels and their, and their commitment to the organization, their productivity naturally rise quite rapidly. And that's really very, very simple. Leaders need to, to take the risk to completely, if need be, overestimate the, 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 the latent and patent talent within the organizations. Well, Guy, thank you so much for sharing your insights into leadership and life. And I think you've done something remarkable. You've made business a lot more scientific, but also a lot more human. Thank you. It's the art and the science. There we go. So thank you so much. All right, Nick. And hope to see you soon. Thanks so much, Nick.